Hello Internet! My name is Jer, the artist behind the YouTube channel and social media platform called Skatu Network. For seven years now, I've been creating art and music on this platform, mainly around but not limited to the genres of ska and punk. Despite the growth of Skatu Network on TikTok, Instagram Reels, long form YouTube content, and even the occasional live shows, the channel started out as nothing more than me taking songs that aren't ska and making them ska songs. And over the course of nearly 400 covers, each and every one followed this very simple premise. With that many videos came the formation and continued improvement of a process behind what I do. Some people are very curious as to how I even make these videos in the first place, and others truly don't understand how much work goes into doing this thing. So this video will be a breakdown of my entire process recording a single Scott2 Network video. By the end of this, you will be very familiar with my entire process, from the very first thought of a cover to the final export of the final video. But before we get into the bulk of this video, Video, I do want to bring something up. This video is going to show just how much work goes into this YouTube channel. Like, it is a lot of work. And you might think after all of that hard work and sweat and tears, I can enjoy that sweet, sweet ad revenue, right? <laughs> nope! Ad revenue on YouTube isn't sustainable, at least not for me. Since I'm mainly covering songs, I get hit by that sweet, sweet copyright claim nearly every single time I upload. So the alternative that allows me to put the full time of work into keeping this channel up is Patreon. For just a couple dollars a month, you can receive benefits like your name in the outro videos, the Scott2 Network Discord, requesting covers on Patreon, early access, and bonus materials. By the end of this video, you're going to see how I put more than a full time's worth of work into this channel. So for the endless hours of entertainment, maybe consider pledging less than a cup of coffee a month over on Patreon. Even a dollar a month, the cost of a Chipotle burrito a year can go so far. And if 1% of my subscribers join my Patreon at a dollar a month, it would materially change the conditions of my life forever. Remember, there's power in numbers, so head on over to patreon.com slash scott2network and pledge at the end of this video. So the very first step that goes into producing a cover for my channel, of course, is picking the song. The channel started out with me just hearing a song and going, yeah, that'd make a great ska song. And after seven years of doing this channel, that's still the case. But these days, I often consult a giant form of Patreon-requested songs. I used to stick to one Patreon-requested song a month, but as the Patreon grew during the pandemic, the list just became massive, and doing one song a month was barely scratching the surface. So over time, it really just became me doing as many Patreon requests as I could possibly keep up with. I've been citing this list of Patreon requested covers every time I pick a song. I keep a priority on the artists and bands that are requested the most frequently, but at the end of the day, I still choose a song to cover based off the very simple vibe of, yeah, that'd make a great ska song. Cause yo, I'ma keep it real for a second. Yes, the bit is I'm going to take every song that is not ska and turn it into ska, but sometimes we just gotta be honest with ourselves. As much as I wanna cover everything that's recommended, I have limits both as a musician and as a human. So here's where I publicly apologize to the person who kept requesting Caravan by Protest the Hero, but an eight minute prog metal song just isn't really feasible for me to turn into ska. <laughs> Like, yes, I can play a lot of things on a lot of instruments, but I don't think I have the musicianship to play a single thing anyone in that band can play on any instrument that I can play. So sorry, I definitely can't get to everything because there's just so many requested songs that are impossible for me to even attempt. But there are also a lot of songs that lend themselves wonderfully to the genre of ska. For example, the last cover I produced is a song I personally hadn't heard before, but it had been requested multiple times. I really went into the cover of That Thing You Do Blind, and I recorded a lot of the process, so I will be referencing that whole process within this video. Now the rest of the song is pretty straightforward. I honestly don't even like overthinking details this early on because I just like to vibe it out while recording. The biggest thing I want to make sure I do is get a good understanding of the structure and the vibe of the song itself. And 
how much time I spend getting familiar with the song depends on how well I know the song and how much content is in the song itself. Like a song like this has a pretty straightforward pop progression and it's very easy to sing along to, almost like that's the whole point of pop music. So I didn't really need to spend that much time getting familiar with it, but it's time I have to dedicate nonetheless. During this time, I'll also listen to the song while cross-referencing it on multiple chord and lyric websites to make sure whatever I am referencing is correct. And once I'm sure on the structure of the song, I'll build a makeshift chart. And honestly, calling this thing a chart seems a little disingenuous. The chart shows things like bars, the chord changes in each bar, and any additional notes like rhythmic hits or whatever. But honestly, if any other musician tried to follow this, they would not know what the f it's talking about. <laughs> But it makes sense to me and that's all I need to make this cover. From deciding on the song to the end of this prep work phase, I already spent a couple hours on this alone. Listening to the song over and over, learning the chords and structure, making a rough chart of the song. As I mentioned, I wasn't too familiar with the song, so the process could have been shorter, but the song is also very straightforward, so the process could have also been a lot longer. But once I feel familiar with the song and confident in its structure, I jump into the process of recording the tune. So, my recording process is pretty streamlined now. When I first started the channel seven years ago, it was strictly off of vibes. In earlier covers, I would often mess up structures, mess up chords, sometimes keep sloppy or out of tune takes, but that's simply because I was doing it just because. For example, my cover of Damn It by Blink-182 I did back in 2018 took approximately three hours from opening the first project to exporting the final video. I was already really familiar with the song, I already knew all the words, the chords were hecka easy, and the quality of that video isn't the best. Now that this has grown into a full-on production, I have much higher standards, therefore it takes me much longer. For instance, it took me about three full days to produce the entire cover of that thing you do. Oftentimes, I split my tracking up into rhythm section on one day, horns and vocals on another, and then another day dedicated solely to the video. But also keep in mind, I'm pretty busy in general. I tour a bunch, I teach a bunch, and I have a lot of other freelance work I do outside of this channel. So, I rarely ever have a full day to work on these covers. Depending on how much other work I have in the week is how I truly split up the recording process. But for this example, I had a lot of time to dedicate to this cover, and on the first day, I recorded the rhythm section and the vocals. I always start out with the drums, because there needs to be something to record to, right? So this is just one of those covers that really, you know, writes itself. Whenever I'm writing out the drums for these covers, I like to think if I was drumming in this band, how would I drum it? And since I'm going for like a two-tone sound, if I was drumming in a band like The Specials or The Selector, how would I drum along to this? How would it sound? And you, you're doing that thing you do. Breaking my heart in. And from there, I basically just record along to the song. When you record over 400 covers using a MIDI keyboard, you build this ability to just play various drum beats on a piano. After completing the drums, I'll play along to the drum track on guitar while singing the parts to make sure the drums actually make sense to what I have in mind for the vocals and guitar. If edits to the drums need to be made, we make them, but if not, yay, the drums are done! And making sure that the drums are good means recording the guitar, bass, and everything else will be very, very seamless. So that's when I move on to recording guitar. Now most of the time I'll have clean guitars and distorted guitars to track separately, but since this song leans more into a two-tone vibe, all of the guitars are clean so I don't have to worry about that. Now when it comes to guitar, I have a pretty simple setup. I have my Reverend Charger here and it's going out to this Kemper right over here. If you're not familiar, a Kemper is like an amp simulator. Now my Kemper has over 700 profiles at 700 different amp simulations on the device itself. I like to mix it up depending on the style of cover I'm doing, what type of tones or sounds that I want. But whenever I don't know what to do, I honestly find myself using the Vox AC30 profile. It's my favorite profile and I think that's pretty obvious obvious considering my amp, oh, where is it? Here it is. My amp of choice in real life is also a Vox AC30. So, shocker right there. And once everything is set up with Logic and the Kemper, and once my guitar is in tune, I'm ready to record some guitar. And if you're thinking, oh, it's just Scar, aren't you just gonna play? 
some upstrokes. Well, the cool thing about ska guitar is it can actually mess around with the phrasing and the rhythms to get different vibes and feels. Like, yeah, I can do straight upstrokes. But I can also do like the Roots Reggae long short strumming pattern. which I think has like a lot more of a danceable groove personally. I can tie the upstrokes over beats two and four. I can add little scoops and embellishments throughout the phrasing. And again, when I choose to do all of this is just strictly off vibes. Once the guitars are finished, I move on over to the bass most of the time. Sometimes I'll do keys first, but I like to fit the keys into the bass line most of the time. Now in this scenario, I already had a bass line that was solid in the verses, and I just had to finagle the rhythm a little bit to make it more ska. So in the original song, the bass line goes something like this. Something like that, give or take, I'm just going off of ear. So bringing it up to our new tempo. And to make it a little bit more ska, I kinda just get rid of the downbeats, honestly. And instead of outlining the full chord, I'm just gonna outline the thirds and then give a little resolve back to the downbeat before the downbeat. The utilization of suspension and anticipation on resolving downbeats is a great way you can add a lot of that upbeat momentum. Since bass is one of the instruments I've played the longest and the first instrument I played in the genre of ska, a lot of bass stuff almost comes secondhand to me. I don't think that hard about it, I kinda just vibe, honestly. <laughs> and once I'm done with all the bass, I then move on to keys. And as of lately, I've started realizing how important keys are to the genre of ska. I find myself recording several layers of keys, at least one organ and one piano track. Now, organ is one of the most unique elements of the orchestration of ska. Not only does it beef up those chords, but it really drives the rhythm of the genre. Now, at its simplest, ska is just the rhythmic genre that follows and to and and for and and to and and for and. You either have instruments that are accenting those upbeats like guitar, or you have instruments accenting those two and fours like the snare and kick. Four, two, four. Now something I've always loved about ska organ is that it acts both as a harmonic instrument and a rhythmic instrument. Now basic ska organ does follow that pattern of and two and and four and and two and and four and and two and and four and and two and and four and. But then you can start getting more expressive with it, messing with things like articulation and the length of the notes to make it a lot more rhythmic. Like it's so good, how can you not move when that ska organ hits? I said it once and I'll say it a million times, organ is the most important instrument in ska! At this point, I've been sitting with the rhythm section stuff for over three hours. With given breaks and all of the pre-planning stuff, this clocks us in at nearly a full day of recording this cover, and we are only halfway through recording the cover itself. 
That means I still have to track trombone, trumpet, sax, and all of the vocals. And I was determined to finish the audio tracking of this in two days, so then I moved on to doing the vocals. Now in most instances, I would actually track the horns first and save the vocals for last, but since a lot of the horn parts were just backgrounds to the vocals, I wanted to get the vocal melodies locked in so I could fit the horns underneath it. I take about 10 to 15 minutes to do a good vocal warm up. This song is very high for me, even though I brought the song down a half step, it still stretches out to the highest note I can consistently and comfortably hit. From there, I'll spend about 20 more minutes getting into the feel of the song. I'll run through sections of it, practicing a few of the vocal lines. And once I feel comfortable getting solid takes, I'll start tracking vocals. Now at this point, I'm just starting to make a lot of dumb mistakes because my brain is mentally fried. I've been working on this cover alone for like seven hours today, and that's excluding all of the other work on other things I've done today. But I really wanna get through tracking the vocals today. It'll make my life tomorrow a lot easier. So I stay consistent as ever and just continue chugging along through this cover. Well, I try and I try to forget you, girl, but it's just so hard to do. Every time you do that thing you do, I, oh. For this cover, I was able to get through large chunks and punch in the corrections if I needed them. And after hours of tracking these vocals, I find myself finishing day one of this recording process. The planning stage is always daunting and the pace of the cover always starts out slow as I figure stuff out. But hearing the song start to come together really changes everything for me. My process starts getting faster and I start getting into the groove as I see the final product come closer and closer. But the last big hurdle when recording this was of course getting the horns going. And I always begin tracking my horns with the trombone. I like to do this because one, trombone is my primary instrument, and two, I firmly see it as the backbone of the horn section in ska. Not only is it the backbone, but it's also the most expressive instrument. The use of the slide creates a unique character, and most other genres put trombone on the back burner. But in the genre of ska, there's always been very talented trombone players innovating the genre. From Don Drummond in the first wave to Rico Rodriguez in the second wave, the foundation of the genre really gave more emphasis to the trombone than any other instrument. Now I couldn't really tell you exactly what I do to play ska trombone. From a fundamental production of sound, I don't approach it any differently from any other style of music. It's more use of expressive elements like articulation, dynamics, and of course, the slide. Playing ska trombone just comes from deeply listening to the genre and honestly just vibing it out. And I'm sorry if you want a direct answer, but hey, you'll never become fluent in a language until you immerse yourself in a culture that speaks nothing but that language. But anyway, that's why I like to track trombone first. It's the instrument I can most easily vibe it out and I can easily fit trumpet and saxophone into that. Now, whenever I'm recording these covers, I like to ask myself what is important to keep the integrity of the song and what isn't. Like there's obviously elements like hooks and melodies that make the song what it is. And then there's other things like solos or background vocals or little embellishments that aren't quite as important. An example of that in this song is the bridge. There's a call and response in the bridge of the song. And instead of doing it like the original where the, I don't ask a, I don't ask a lot, girl. You know, I'm not gonna do all that. I'm just gonna sing the vocal line once and then I'm actually gonna do the response on trombone. And with the bridge having that halftime rock steady feel, I just feel like ripping that trombone in the style of like Rico Rodriguez is just a perfect fit. Like just hitting you with the, Tasty. As a horn player, I think it's important to remember that these instruments are modeled after the perfect instrument that we are born with, our voice. And when you listen to ska trombone players in particular, they're making the instruments sing. They are very expressive with it. Think of the trombone solo in A Message to You, Rudy by The Specials. Rico's trombone solo isn't very noty. It's not very technical. It's not like shedding the way you would see a jazz musician playing it. It's extremely simple, but what makes it so good is the way that Rico makes the trombone just sing. <laughs> It's very simple, but when utilizing the slide and other expressive tools like articulations and dynamics, you can just do so much with so little. Now the trombone takes the longest to track. 
Depending on how long the song is and how busy the horns are, it can take up to two hours or even more. The trumpet and sax, however, don't take nearly as long to track. I move over to trumpet next, mainly because I don't want to move the mic and the placement for trombone is similar to trumpet. Honestly, that's it. That's the only reason. I'm lazy. I'd otherwise do sax next because in my pyramid of priority, the trumpet is at the very top. You do not need it that much. In fact, you need it the least out of every instrument in ska. And while recording trumpet and sax, I kind of notice a trend every time that I record where the amount of time it takes me to record the trombone is equal to the amount of time it takes to record the trumpet and sax together. But of course, that's not a hard rule. That's just a trend I've noticed. Sometimes trumpet and sax can take even longer depending on how easy or hard it is to play. Okay, so the majority of the song is very simple to play, but the bridge has some faster passages, and I'm gonna be honest for a second, I've just barely been playing brass over the last few months. I've just been busy between teaching, between working on other stuff, and between being on tour with Jer. And unlike We're the Union, I just sing in Jer, I'm not the trombone player, and I just hop on stage once with my horn throughout the entire set. So after being busy with marching season and being on the road throughout the fall and winter, I find myself coming home with chops that are a little rusty, and it takes a little longer for me to get these takes. So it's taking me a little longer than I wanted to to get these parts down, but I also want to make sure not only am I getting the right notes, but I'm matching the articulations. Obviously, the function of a saxophone, trombone, and trumpet are all very different. And what might be simple on one instrument might be a little harder on another instrument. Glissing in or out of a note on one instrument might be very easy, but glissing in or out of a note on another instrument might be very difficult. But I don't care. I will put the extra work in to make sure the articulation is matching as close as I can across all of the horns. If you want your horn section to sound good, match articulations. Once I finish the trumpet, I adjust the microphone and move on over to the sax. For this song, sax was the easiest to play, which is ironic because sax is definitely my weakest instrument. But at this point, I've already played these melodies on two different instruments. And whenever I learn these parts on multiple instruments, I feel like I have a lot more solid and deep understanding, not only of the ins and outs of the melody, but how the melody fits into the chords and the overall progression of the song. Now I just finished recording all of the saxophone and that puts us at about four hours of recording horns today and leaves us at about 13 hours of recording this cover. And guess what? We're still not done! With the song fully recorded, it's on to the next step of mixing and video recording. Now let me explain why this is basically one step. Now when it comes to my real music that I record, like my commissions, my freelance stuff, or my original music that I put out under Jer, which you should check out by the way, I'll typically spend a lot more time recording and mixing, especially towards the end on the mixing side of things. But with YouTube and content creation, I just have to put out a lot of content with very little time. So I've streamlined the process a little bit and cut a few corners. I have a bunch of preset mix chains that I've built over the years, each with their own unique vibes. I set my guitar presets on the guitars, my bass presets on the bass, my vocal presets on the vocals, and then I tweak the EQs, compression, and other elements to dial it in fully. And once the mix sounds pretty good, I then go to record the video. Now, if you didn't know, I basically have to get one full pass on the song on each instrument. Now, assuming I make no mistakes and get every single take right on the first try, it's still drums, bass, guitar, keys, trumpet, trombone, sax, and vocals. Eight takes of a two minute song. Given a minute or so between each take, that's 20 minutes. But of course, that's never how it goes. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even have the time to record the video and it'll be a week after I record all of the audio. And when that happens, there's the downside of vibing everything out. I don't really have the music written out and I don't exactly remember what I did. So depending on how long the time is, is how long I have to spend kind of relearning all of those things I recorded. And it could be up to an hour of me sitting down with my guitar, bass, horns, whatever, relearning the song. Now for that thing you do, I didn't go that long after and I really only have to double check the keys and bass maybe like two or three times. It only added like 30 minutes max. 
Once I feel re-familiarized with the song, I'll start recording the video. I'll do at least one pass on each instrument of the song. But even with miming the song, I'll often play a wrong chord or play a wrong thing and I hyper focus that someone's gonna notice that the fret was off by one thing. So I'll fix every single mistake that I make or try my best to. <laughs> So each instrument will end up getting like two or three passes of the song, plus a bunch of little takes of me playing certain sections correctly. And then on top of that, I always find myself editing and despite having 20 different takes of this song, there's like one or two parts in the whole cover where none of the 20 takes look good. So I'll do a thing where I'll basically sing the song with each instrument. Like I'll take the verse and record myself singing while holding my trumpet. And then I'll take the chorus and record it with me singing while holding trombone. Sorry if this is like ruining the movie magic of, of this, but hey, we all have to learn that Santa's not real at some point, am I right? But there is a plus side to that. Doing that over and over and over again really helps me memorize the lyrics a lot better because I am horrible with lyrics. When recording these videos, I find myself spending about 15 minutes per instrument, but if the song is really difficult, it can be up to 30 minutes per instrument. But with the vocals, I find myself spending a solid half hour to an hour just getting them down. Now, thankfully, this song wasn't super wordy, and thankfully, I was able to memorize a lot of the words while recording the other instruments and also just recording the song in general. So the video actually went by fairly quickly. I think it took me like maybe two hours to record. And by the time those hours go by, I feel a little different about the mix. I start to notice certain things stick out. Other things are really buried. And so after recording the video, I'll sit down with the mix one last time and make a few tweaks. I'll bounce a wave file, send it to myself, and listen while I'm doing chores, listen while I'm driving, spend the next day or so just listening to the song in different listening environments. But I'll keep listening to the song. Sometimes I'll send it to other people for some feedback. But once I get to the editing process, I try to bounce one final mix of the song. And that's why I consider the video filming and the mixing as one single step. Now at this point, I finished recording all of the audio, all of the video. I've given the song a good mix, but we're still not done because we have to edit the whole thing together. It took me about two hours to film the video, and over the course of the last couple of days, I have now put like 15 hours into this one cover. And we still have to go and edit the entire video. So of course, while recording these covers, I do everything from home, meaning I cannot leave my house at all and from start to finish do the entire video. But I don't like being cooped up in my house all the time. I am not about that life. I like sunshine. I like getting out of the house talking to people. So for the editing process, I typically find myself hopping on my bike and going to a coffee shop in town and do my editing. Now the video editing process is actually fairly simple. I take the cover and I drop it into a sequence in Premiere. Then I take the video file of every single pass that I recorded, I find where the good takes are, and then I crop them and drop them in. This is why it's imperative I try my best to get as little takes as possible. The more takes I have to take, the longer it takes to sync everything together. I try to use the function in Premiere where I can sync the video to an audio file, but sometimes it just doesn't line up correctly, or if I'm just doing a bunch of takes, it won't like, you know, it, it's just a mess sometimes. And I find it easier sorting through a long video with 10 attempts than 10 different video files to find which one is the best attempt. But once it's lined up, I make cuts to the beat of the song that work, and then from there, I just delete out clips until I find which takes look the best. The editing process takes at least one hour for a song, but honestly, it most of the time never takes more than two. Now, if I was editing a video for something I did, like, I don't know, explaining how I do the entire recording process I do, that can take way longer just to script, just to record, edit, and everything. <laughs> I know if I did something like that, I would definitely like give it a comment, a like, a thumbs up, and maybe share it. But for real, once I finish editing, I hit export, my settings are already preset, and that's basically it. For nearly 400 videos, I've done more or less this very same thing. I hope that this video has given insight to those who have no idea how much work goes into this channel. It's a lot of work. Sometimes it's agonizing. Sometimes things go wrong. Sometimes I spend my only time home between tours cranking these videos out. Sometimes I'm up until 5 a.m. editing. 
Sometimes my computer crashes and I lose everything. And sometimes I import this footage and realize that my microphone died and I had to re-record a bunch of it. It's never fully consistent. However, it is something cool that I can do and it's cool to have a fan base who support this thing that I do. All right, cool, hello. I've switched over to my GoPro because um, my microphone for my camera died on me and it's just not working. And it was pretty ironic because I was in the middle of filming a part talking about how it takes a lot to run this channel and a lot of work goes into this and sometimes things are going smoothly and then I spend an hour to an hour and a half working on trying to get something to work because things are always breaking because it's hard being a content creator. Like I'm not even lying. I had a part where I said it's not easy maintaining eight instruments video gear, audio production gear, on top of paying rent and utilities and all that stuff. This is exactly what I mean by it is very difficult maintaining this stuff. So yeah, instead of talking about how agonizing it could be being a content creator and all of the things going wrong, you can firsthand experience my frustration right here and see that things can go wrong. So like I said at the beginning of the video, the best way you can support this channel is by supporting me over on Patreon. So head on over to patreon.com slash scott2network to support the channel in any way that you can. And I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay, bye.